had any treatment for alcohol or drug abuse in the past? Yeah, I mean, I've had alcohol detox probably seven or eight times. Okay. Anything for drug problems? Just no, it's just, just for alcohol, not for drugs. Okay. Um, seven or eight times. Okay, so let's say eight times. And um, how many of these times were only detoxification? Uh, I think they were, it was only it was only for drug for alcohol detox. Okay. Um, did you usually leave detox before you were advised to in the past? Uh, mm, I, didn't, I didn't leave before I was advised to, no. Okay. And after detox, have you usually entered continued treatment? No, I, I usually usually don't do that. Something stops me, I guess. Okay. Uh, how many days have you been treated in an outpatient setting for alcohol or drugs in the past 30 at all? Have you had any treatment? Even AA? Okay. No, I haven't had treatment. I really don't like those meetings. Okay. In the past 90 days, have you relapsed after being discharged from a treatment program? No, but I probably should have been on some kind of treatment. Okay. Um, and you haven't just successfully completed a treatment because you haven't been in treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, what substance would you say is the major problem? Uh, definitely alcohol. Yeah, alcohol, yeah. And how long was your last period of voluntary absence for, for this? Maybe three months. Three months, okay. Um, and um, how many months ago did this abstinence end? Maybe three months ago. About, okay, three months ago you had a three month abstinence ending at that point. And how many times have you overdosed on drugs or alcohol? I'd say never. Never? Okay. Um, so, if you would, imagine yourself in the environment in which you previously used drugs or the alcohol. We can talk about the alcohol in your case. If you were living in this environment today where you drink, what's the likelihood that you would use, that you would drink? I'm sure I'll drink if I stay there, but I can't let that happen. Okay. So, would you say extremely likely? Yeah. How strong, rate how strong your urges are for, for, for alcohol when something in the environment reminds you of it. Oh, really strong. All I want to do is get a beer. Okay, so would you say considerably or, or extremely? Well, it's considerable now, but we'll get extreme later. Okay, how strong is your desire to use any drug right now? Well, considerable, at least for a drink. Okay, but how about for a drug, like your oxycontin? Uh, yeah, it's pretty strong. Okay, would you say considerably? Not yeah, when, when my headaches are bad, yeah, it's considerable. Okay. Um, have your addiction symptoms increased recently? Yeah, they definitely have. How would you say they have? Well, the headaches have gotten worse and also the craving for beer. Okay. All right, and you mentioned something about... Okay, I just want to point something out here. So this is an example of an open-ended question, a probe question. And there are actually a lot of these in here, although we may not get to see that many of them because we're really just scratching the surface. But uh, you know, I asked, have your addiction symptoms increased recently? And she just gave a, you know, a quick answer, yes, they have. And that's really not going to inform us a lot for the purpose of a clinical decision process. It might be sufficient for a research interview, but we actually want to understand what's happening. So then it prompts the counselor to ask how. And the dot, 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 the ellipsis, indicates an open-ended question where you just wait and listen to the full response. And one of the things that we can do with the structured interview is if the patient needs prompting, we can then offer prompting in a variety of areas. So you'll see. Um, ask about any items not mentioned by the patient. Have you had more craving? How about risk behaviors? And so this gets the patient into more depth and invites them to spend more time 
because they might otherwise think, you know, you've been asking, well, when was the last time I drank? You know, so I'll just give you the quick answers because you, all you want is quick answers. And obviously that's not a good clinical interview. So interspersed throughout this interview are both the short answers and ones that really allow the patient to take off a bit. The problem with that, which is a good clinical style of interviewing, is how do you get different counselors to give a standard entry in the data so that two counselors would give the same answer after the patient has just spent you know, two minutes talking about different things in their life. And that has to be structured. Now, typically, in research assessments, you train the research assistants extensively and test them on it. And you give them you know, scores of one, two, three, and four. We can't do that in the clinical world. We have to be much more clinical. So you see the drop-down box here for all of these options. And the first one is, you know, no, they haven't increased. But then there's increased thoughts or craving, which is a subjective experience. More risk-taking <coughs> behaviors, which is behavioral, but not use. Then there's relapsed, but to less than when using before. And then the worst possible case is increased use or more acute root of administration than before. Now, the patient is saying that she's actually adding whiskey to her two six-packs, which you really could consider either increased use or almost an increased root of administration because the absorption, because of whiskey's higher alcohol content, the absorption is more rapid and, of course, the concentration of alcohol is higher. So the goal in these, we call these anchor phrases, Instead of putting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we put these anchor phrases in for all of these kinds of questions so that two counselors will look at a patient doing the same data and come up with pretty much the same one, or at the, at the most, two adjacent items without a lot of confusion. Is that clear? Whiskey before, so you've added whiskey two beer? Um, yeah, I've, I've added a whiskey to the six packs I've been drinking. Okay, so whiskey on top of the six packs of beer. Okay, do you feel you're likely to continue using or continue drinking? Well, I don't think I'll be able to stop drinking or using the pills. Even today? Even yeah. Today? Okay. Um, do you have any concerns about pursuing treatment? Not about detox, but I have trouble continuing after that, and I'm, I'm too nervous to sit in those AA meetings. Okay. Um, all right. Um, how do you think treatment will help? Well, I'm hoping that uh, everything, like my head and the rest of me, will get better and my boyfriend won't kick me out. Okay, fine. So you have some sense of, of what might be helpful, okay? And what might cause you to relapse in the future? Well, if my boyfriend throws me out or I get fired, that would. Okay, so you have some real risks and the timing is, is coming up. How do you plan to prevent relapses? Let's say after detox. So well, I, I just need to stop drinking. Stay sober for a change. Okay. Now, you've seen a quantity, recency, frequency type of assessment. You've seen it move into a diagnostic category assessment. And now, we're, we've gotten into motivation and readiness for change. And Again, they're supposed to be open-ended questions, and she's really not able to do much with open-ended questions on motivation. It, it's hard to see much active forethought about what she's prepared to do, um, how she's going to address these specific problems. She's almost bereft of clues about what it's going to take. So we want counselors to be able to rate this, and we want to be able to rate this in a meaningful, reliable, and and ultimately predictive fashion. So that's why we offer these phrases of response. Somebody who is totally negative, 
is a discrete category of response. She's not totally negative. But somebody who has multiple resistances to treatment options, that's an important issue. And she has at least you know, resistance to group, whether it's AA, and it's probably going to apply to other groups as well. She's also never followed through to treatment. So she's got a history that probably predicts the challenges lying ahead. Um, she doesn't have specific proactive expectations, and she doesn't have a history of positive efforts. So each of these things helps characterize a different kind of state. And that's why these phrases are broken out. The first time you use it, you really have to read each one of these phrases and think about how does it distinguish between two different types of patient. But what we found in the research at MGH and also in New York City uh, and Norway is that it takes about 20 times going through this to get through the learning curve. And even novice counselors, people coming right out of BAs uh, and entering the workforce for the first time we hired them as research assistants, after they'd done 20 of these interviews, they kind of understood the flow and the, the layout of the interview. And they understood for each of these questions that there are these distinctions and you can read them quickly and figure out, oh yeah, this lady is passive, she doesn't have a history of following through, she's got objections and resistances to specific aspects of treatment. I know how I can rate her in this instrument. <coughs> and then behind the screen in the computer, these are all converted into numerical ratings, which all translate into different decision points in the algorithm. So it's all quantitative, even though the way we've just interviewed her and assessed her is very clinical and seemingly qualitative. This admission or basic prompted or Okay. Now, if we were just continuing along in the interview, you could just keep hitting tab and then next, and you end up in the legal information section. And this follows the ASI sequence where less sensitive or more obvious areas of inquiry are the ones that we start with, like general information and medical history. Those aren't heavily stigmatized. It gives the patient time to get used to the interviewer and to develop a little bit of a rapport. OK, my interviewer is interested in me. My interviewer is asking me questions um, that I understand. My interviewer isn't put off by all of my health problems that I've really brought down on my own head thanks to my drinking. Um, and so I'm ready now. I'm comfortable enough to answer about my drug problems. And then it progresses into legal, which can be more sensitive and stigmatizing, and even psychological, which can be really, um, in some patients, even more sensitive than the drug and alcohol issues. So now I want you to click into the legal information section. And it would be a good time at this point to switch off if you're sharing a laptop, have the partner who's been observing switch and start inputting the data. And we'll go through the second half of our hands-on exercise. And just for my own curiosity, have any of you pairs been using the left hand of one of you and the right hand of the other of you to do this? Just, I want to see the first time that happens. Okay. All right. No, but well, one guy has a computer all to himself and he's been using his feet. All right. Let's continue. So you clicked into legal and the interview. Are you criminal justice system by any chance? No. It was prompted by my boyfriend. Okay. And what factors might help you to stay in treatment? Well, if he doesn't kick me out, that would help. Okay, let's make sure we know where we are. You got into legal, and then a little bit into the process of legal. Okay. So there are questions about was the interview prompt was the assessment prompted by a legal referral? And we want to understand whether this is a coerced assessment. And how coerced? Is it mandated? 
Is it family driven? Because the literature tells us that coercion is important, 